trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 96 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris and this is Paris. Hello. This time we read Universal Harvester by John Darniel. We read this at the request of our patron, Will. Thanks, Will. Um, I have a lot of thanks to say to Will for this one, honestly. Uh, when we asked him, I, I we kind of know Will personally for this. So uh, sort I was of. Able to... I, don't know that, I don't know that I've ever actually met Will in person. I have. Oh, you have. Okay. That's um, kind of fun. He was one of the donators for my Graveborn uh, music video where I used a bunch of books. He had a bunch of books oh. in a in his car in a parking lot, and he was like, yo, you want some books? And I took a bunch of books. Wow, look at that. Look at that real-life patron magic. I know. He had a lot of books, and it feels like Will is a big reader based on his social media posting here. So I was pretty interested to see what he would hand us here, honestly. And... uh I, so I went to him and I asked him why he chose this one, which usually we don't get to do for patrons. Um, and I found that he didn't dig it because it was marketed as a horror story and he was kind of waiting for a big scary part. And that kind of doesn't happen here. And that's a big mistake by whoever marketed this or so, sold it as such because uh, that's, that's not what this is. Yeah, I mean, I, if this was marketed as horror and I saw the title Universal Harvester, I'd be like, oh, fuck, this is this is going to be some murder. It's going to be some blood and gore, but it's really not. It's This book is more of a suspense thriller. Uh, it's, you know, it's got some elements that are perhaps frightening due to the fact that they are undefined. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't classify this as horror, so... Yeah, I would say that that's the classification is the problem. Uh, the book itself, though, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but you may know the author. Uh, so I didn't realize this. Chris pointed it out. Uh, the author, John Darnell, is apparently the guy uh, is the Mountain Goats. Uh, that that indie, are they a folk punk band, indie band? No, I'm not I really wouldn't. Sure. I mean, maybe some of their earlier stuff might fall into that area but i would just call them indie rock indie something a lot you know a lot of open guitar chords and very earnest lyrics is okay the name of the game here yeah so it's the guy from the mountain goats uh apparently he also john darnell the author also does a podcast called i only listen to the mountain goats that's pretty funny it's a podcast where he talks about the songs that he wrote I guess that I guess that follows pretty logically, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess he's also an author. Um, I I don't know anything about the Mountain Goats other than everyone I know who listens to them is like into folk punk and indie stuff. So that was just I have no point of reference. So I've never heard the music. I don't know anything about Mr. Danielle. So I listen uh, to a couple of tunes here and there, and you know, like like I said, open guitar chords, very earnest lyrics fine for what they are not exactly my jam yeah i don't i mean just based on the genre description not not my bag but regardless this man also authors books and uh that's what we're going to be talking about today so if uh if you've never listened to the terrible book club before what we do here is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover title summary or some combination of those three although sometimes like today we read a book that our patron has selected for us so uh in general we do the opposite of what most people do when they are browsing a bookstore or browsing titles online. Uh, and typically this results in a disappointing read. But once in a while, we end up liking the book. Uh, so for content warnings today, we have uh, our usual barnyard language. So we, we swear a lot and speak pretty casually. Today, not that much. Uh, this one's 
pretty safe. We've got uh, car accidents and then suggested suggested confinement, torture, and death. Nothing explicit. Uh, Would you like some confinement and torture? Maybe. You can have some if you want. I'm just suggesting. <laughs> uh, there's also uh, one mention of a dildo. That's all I got. <laughs> That's I don't, I, just a single... I don't we were ever going to bring that up, Paris, so you oh, could have totally I was. that under the rug. I, but... I was and I have. So um, well, I think it's good for people to know in case they want to pick it up. I don't know. People are <laughs> sensitive. Yeah, in case there's a stray dildo mentioned that catches you up. <laughs> well, I was don't... having a great time with this book until... He dared to mention a fake phallus. My whole day was ruined. Nay, my week. Uh, anyway. All right. So the, the print, printed slash published summary for this one's actually a bit long. So uh, this is the official back of the book summary for Universal Harvester. Ahem. Jeremy works at the Video Hut in Nevada, Iowa. It's a small town in the center of the state. The first A in Nevada pronounced A. Oh, I guess it's Nevada. Shit. I've been pronouncing it wrong the whole time. This Nevada. Is part, this is part of the summary. Nevada. Nevada. This is the late 1990s. And even if the Hollywood video in Ames poses an existential threat to Video Hut, there are still regular customers, a rush in the late afternoon. It's good enough for Jeremy. It's a job, quiet and predictable. And it gets him out of the house where he lives with his dad and where they both try to avoid missing mom, who died six years ago in a car wreck. But when a local school teacher comes in to return her copy of Targets, an old movie starring Boris Karloff, one Jeremy himself had ordered for the store, she has an odd complaint. There's something on it, she says, but doesn't elaborate. Two days later, a different customer returns a different tape, a new release, and says, it's not defective exactly, but altered. There's another movie on this tape. Jeremy doesn't want to be curious, but he brings the movies home to take a look. And indeed, in the middle of each movie, the screen blinks dark for a moment, and the movie is replaced by a few minutes of jagged, poorly lit home video. The scenes are odd and sometimes violent, dark, and deeply disquieting. There are no identifiable faces, no dialogue or explanation. The first video has just the faint sound of someone breathing, but there are some recognizable landmarks. These have been shot just outside of town. In Universal Harvester, the once placid Iowa fields and farmhouses now sinister and imbued with loss and instability and profound foreboding. The novel will take Jeremy and those around him deeper into this landscape than they have ever expected to go. They will become part of a story that unfolds years into the past and years into the future, part of an impossible search for something someone once lost and that they would do anything to regain. All right, our characters and setting. We're obviously in Nevada, Iowa. Excuse me, we're in Nevada. <laughs> Nevada, no. Iowa. <laughs> Nevada, Iowa. Okay. Uh, Nevada, Iowa. Big Latin Nevada. America. <laughs> All right. Our um, main character here is Jeremy Helt. He is an employee of Video Hut. Uh, Steve Helt, Jeremy's dad. Just reminded me of Steve Holt. Uh, anyway, Steve Helt, Jeremy's dad. Stephanie, the school teacher, uh, customer at the Video Hut who brings in. Oh, no, wait. I'm wrong. Stephanie is the girl around Jeremy's age that he kind of has a crush on that they, they sort of work together to try to solve this thing. Sarah Jane is the owner of the video hut. She's the boss. Ezra, just another employee at the video hut. And as Chris has correctly pointed out in the notes, uh, Ezra also serves to be the general plot pawn. Uh, <laughs> Lisa Sample, she is uh, arguably the narrator and protagonist, but you don't really figure that out for a while. Uh, Peter and Irene Sample, Lisa's parents, uh, Michael Christopher, trash preacher, Ed, Emily, James, and Abby, a family who later become wrapped up in the uh, Sample cinematic universe as Jeremy and Stephanie and uh, his family did. So it's all a lot there. It's a lot going on. Uh, yeah. Chris Chris did a, did a breakdown. He tried to do uh, maybe not chronological, but chronological in order of the book. Uh, breakdown of what the actual story is. So uh, I'm going to say, Chris, do you want to just tell people that we thought this book was good? Yeah. Okay. I... We thought this book was good. And uh, if you're into maybe like Chuck Palahniuk or, or like style books uh, when, or, or maybe like Tarantino directed films, things that are kind of like puzzles uh, told out of order and that you have to work at with some really pretty language, I would say, 
you want to read this book. So um, maybe just skip ahead a few minutes if you don't want any spoiler, or just don't listen to this episode if you want yeah, any wait spoilers. till after. I, um, I really want to say that when I talked to Will about this, he was disappointed by it largely because of how it was marketed. But coming into it with no idea what's going on here might have helped that a lot. And for, I, when I had that conversation with Will, he almost felt a little bad that we didn't get a book we dislike. But on the contrary, Will, thank you very much for giving us something interesting and very likable to read. It's great when that kind of thing pops up for us, honestly. Yeah, dude, it's a huge relief when I start reading something and I'm like, oh, this is good. Wait, it's still not bad. Wait, there's still no rape? Oh, my God, this is great. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, that too. That's really like, cool when that no, doesn't happen. Oh, man. I mean, when we get a book that doesn't have sexual assault and is good, it's TBC Christmas, man. Yeah. It's This is so thank you Came for the recommendation. This year. Yeah, and I also like I like being able to say, hey, we somebody submitted a book to us that they didn't think we'd like, but we ended up liking it. You know, it's, it's a nice... Uh, Nice way to show that we don't hate everything. <laughs> yeah. So in any case, um, we're thinking that you might want to read this book, unless you're not interested in this sort of, in the setting that was described or in, in the, maybe the descriptors the I gave. But um, just a warning that we're going to go into full spoiler territory, just swimming in the spoilers. Yeah. So uh, yeah, here's the summary that I wrote up. It's a little bit lengthy, so settle in here. Jeremy is an early 20s video store clerk who lives with his dad, coasting through a generally unremarkable life. After a few people mention weird things popping up in movies they rent, Jeremy almost absentmindedly investigates by taking one of the defective movies to watch home with him. In the middle of one of them, a sudden edit changes the scene to a corrugated metal shed with a chair in it with nothing else for a solid few minutes. In another... A figure in a head-enclosing hood is in the chair with whoever is behind the camera interacting with them in creepy ways, such as painting eye-like splotches on the hood. Jeremy's curiosity is aroused, although he tries to push it away at first. One of the customers who mentioned the strange edits, Stephanie, becomes more curious and insists they investigate further. Jeremy eventually shows the strange scenes to others, including his father his father's friend slash kind of girlfriend, and the video store's proprietor, Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane's curiosity is also aroused when she sees another addition after the end credits of one movie, a farmhouse and shed she recognizes since she grew up in the area. She drives to that house and finds Lisa Sample, the owner, whom she befriends very quickly and begins to spend more and more time with away from the store, which disturbs Jeremy. Jeremy learns of the house and Lisa from Sarah Jane, who confirms that Lisa is in some of the disturbing scenes from the tapes. We get snippets of Sarah Jane interacting with Lisa Sample, never quite enough to know exactly what's going on between them besides an uneasy friendship. Jeremy's curiosity finally gets the better of him, and he drives out to Lisa's home, only to find his co-worker Ezra's car overturned in a ditch, with Ezra injured on the way there. We then smash cut to the story of Peter and Irene Sample, Lisa's parents. Irene and Peter live a dull domestic life in mid-century Midwestern America with all the trappings of a lower middle-class family. Irene has an encounter with a preacher who dumpster dives for food, is eventually taken in by his flock, stops attending her regular church's masses and meetings until she suddenly disappears with the congregation, leaving Lisa and Peter behind. Lisa and Peter spend years attempting to track her down fruitlessly. Irene is never seen again, having been abandoned by the nomadic cult when she was arrested for shoplifting, her fate unknown. This is a little bit of a murky detail here. Uh, you know, it could be true, could not be true, depending on how you read certain parts of the story. Mm, yeah. Anyway, back in Jeremy time. Jeremy we... Jeremy. Back in <laughs> yeah. We see Jeremy encountering Lisa and Sarah Jane at Lisa's home for the first time. After, after getting met Ezra some medical attention. That's a good order of operations there. Yeah. Yeah. He is unnerved after this and calls Stephanie to go back out there and interrogate both of the women to find out exactly what is going on. When they both go out to Lisa's house, Lisa either convinces them or forces them to take part in a video interview of some kind. Very murky there on whether they were forced or not where she questions them about their mothers and possibly her own and hits Jeremy at some points, like strikes him a few times. In the face. Um, this right is after face. he mentions that he's not sure if he misses his own mother sometimes. 
This part is very vague about exactly what goes on, other than Lisa has been doing this for years with many different people and splicing certain segments that don't contain any identifying info into videos that can be rented from the video hut and possibly some other places. Years later, a family convenes on the former Lisa Sample-owned property when two retired parents, Ed and Emily, purchase it. Their two adult children, James and Abby, are coming to visit them for the first time at their new home. James and Ed discover a burnt-out car chassis with a series of strangely labeled VHS tapes in the trunk. These tapes are the interviews that Lisa filmed and was splicing into rentals, as well as a series of old surveillance footage that Lisa would watch looking for signs of her mother, Irene. The family watches the videos together, is disturbed, and discussed investigating further. James manages to track down Jeremy's former house, where his father, Steve, still lives. The two have a talk. James gets Jeremy's email, and he writes to him, asking for an explanation. Jeremy assures James that he's okay and gives him current Lisa's current address, although he warns James to not bother her, even though he gets it that it's almost an impossibility that he won't bother her. The family then drives to the address. They see Lisa in a window. Lisa waves. The family waves back, and they move on. And that's the end of the story. Yeah, so uh, it's, I can understand if a lot of that was confusing uh, or just didn't make sense to you. It's one of those stories that's really hard to tell people what the book is about when they ask you, what's the book about? Because I got <laughs> asked that question when I told people I was reading this and it I gave a summary that was almost equally as long. Yeah, I mean, I think at its core, uh, it's a, there's a mystery here. Uh, you spend... Uh, all of the book wondering about various things and not never really feeling like you've come to a definitive conclusion about some stuff. Um, I do think that Darnielle does a good job of giving us some closure because honestly, if he hadn't given us anything about Lisa's motivations, I would have just assumed she was like a serial killer. Yeah. Uh, because so I'm really glad that he didn't leave us totally hanging at the end. Cause there's like, I think one of the final three paragraphs is like, all right, this is the deal with Lisa, kind of. Again, it's not like the most clear thing in the world, but I think Chris's um, summary works pretty well. So basically, in, in chronological order, you have Lisa's parents getting together, giving birth to Lisa. Um, Lisa's mother, Irene, getting kind of seduced not sexually but seduced by the trash spiritually creature. spiritually spiritually spiritual seduced. seduction yeah by the <laughs> trash 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 uh by the trash preacher um and his congregation so they what oh god what year was this 50s maybe yeah it was like yeah. slightly post-war yeah so uh 50s 60s like i said you got Irene, Lisa's mom, getting spiritually seduced by the trash preacher and his congregation where they, they, yeah, they, they only eat, uh, scraps and, and like bits of leftovers and they, they only eat together. So everyone gathers all their scraps from their, their family's meals, brings them to a church. Then they combine them all and eat it all together, which sounds fucking disgusting. (laughs) Jesus Christ. All different meal scraps shoved together in one horrendous Ugh. casserole. <laughs> yeah, the, not, yeah, it's just horrible. And there's no mention of heating this at all. So, oh, just yeah. cold, cold, cold scraps casserole. Cold, Come on go- down to Jim Bob's cold scraps casserole shack where we just got the trash food. We done dug it up and put it all together for the sake of Jesus. Cold trash casserole uh, brings you closer to God. Um, I'm sorry, Michael Christopher's cold trash casserole shack. Yeah, Michael Christopher is the name of the their preacher, their leader. It's a very small congregation, so in addition to having these like weird cold trash casseroles together, um, they also never change or wash their clothes. They always wear, they wear hand-me-downs and seem to never bathe. Um, and they all also are very gaunt- and malnourished because they are barely eating since they only take part in the collective trash casseroles. Um, trash rolls. Trash rolls. Cold trash rolls. Um, so eventually Irene decides to follow them when they move on to another city. 
uh, you know, and you, you find out later that this is just what they do. They stay in one place for a few months or maybe a year or something, and then they, they, they take everyone and move on. I'm not really sure of the purpose of that. Probably to um, kidnap as many people as possible, frankly. <laughs> uh, even then to, like, what end? I, I'm not sure yeah, I don't, what Michael I don't Christopher's motivations are. And, like, I think that might even be unimportant in the long run. Yeah, it, I, I, think it, I think it is unimportant. I mean, I think... Whenever you look at cult leaders, their motivations are are purely um, selfish, right? You know, they just want people to follow them and trust them and to have control over others. And I think that's a, that's a, something you could reasonably assume here. I, I mean, or maybe he's very genuine and thinks that this is what God wants, to just take these people away from their families and... Make them eat trash rolls. I I, I don't know. Uh, maybe the he, holiest of dinners. Maybe he has some kind of imbalance in his brain chemicals, and he's not seeing reality clearly. I don't know. But as Chris pointed out, that's not really important to this story. It's just a part. It's just a small part of it. So after you know, Irene kind of gets I don't know, willfully abducted, brainwashed by this cult. Essentially, you know, poor Lisa's only five, and her and her dad just you know, spend tons of time moving around, paying investigators. Um, at one point, his dad even set up these surveillance cameras um, to record trash cans and streets where he knows the cult might be, you know, because he eventually connects with other people who have had family members get kind of brainwashed by this cult. And so they, they start plotting like where the cult is going to be and they set up these surveillance cameras to try to see if they can catch a glimpse of Irene. And this is obviously where Lisa's fascination with uh, with video and with um, kind of impromptu, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, candid, candid recordings comes in because this, you know, her dad thinks that this is perhaps the only way they're ever going to be able to see her mom again. So it makes sense that like if you're five years old and suddenly you're like, oh, if I just keep watching these videos, I'll see mom again. Her weird video splicing psychosis thing makes total sense, I feel. Yeah. Um, but that's only revealed like in the last two paragraphs of the book. I something mean, like that. Maybe the last two pages. Some, something of that, of that. Around there. And obviously that's sort of what the universal harvester is. Right. 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 Is cameras. Yes. Um, so uh, or or of the person who collects that footage, Lisa, sure. you know. So, um, you know, she develops, clearly develops this kind of um, fixation with candid video. And at some point in her life, decides she's just going to start, um, For at first she started splicing that very footage. So the footage that her dad was hoping to find her mom on, she started splicing that into movies. Um, I guess in a, in a, a desperate effort that somebody might recognize something or um, that it'll somehow bring her mom back. And, and again, I don't, I don't think that that makes logical sense, but I think it makes sense in like an, a, an emotional kind of fixated way. I would like to butt in here and say that John Darnielle was a psychiatric worker for a lot of his life before the mountain goats took off. Oh, fuck. So he could, he could possibly have some insight into things like this. Well, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, so, again, I understand that, like, logically that seems a little weird, but I can understand it um, from Lisa's perspective. I think a lot of the point of the story is the illogical manifestations that things like this can have on our psyche. Like, it, it very rarely makes sense. And that curiosity that arises from people that are just looking at this for the first time through, you know, the spliced in footage... It's a strange thing for them to see, and they just need to know more about it. Yeah, I also wonder if her motivation was maybe not, if her main motivation wasn't like, oh, maybe I'll somehow find my mom, even though that makes no sense. I wonder if it was maybe she wanted people to feel as unsettled and unresolved as she does, you know, because she's had this mystery in her life with these scenes spliced in, you know, of points where they thought they might have seen her mom or might know where the cult is and she's ultimately left with no resolution. And perhaps she just wanted other people to experience that. Um, I, I think that that makes sense to me. Her motivations in general are very murky for everything that she's doing here. 
And even when she starts splicing in her own video interviews into movies, I wasn't ever sure if she was intentionally trying to lure more people to her or not, or if there was just the sort of gravity of her trauma that would bring people to there. But, I mean, she was splicing in she, pictures of her own home at the end of movies, at least that one movie that Sarah Jane saw. So there must have been some motivation to bring people into the fold. And she oh, mentions yeah. other people mm -hmm. coming to her. Yeah, of course she does. Yeah, this is definitely a way to bring people into, like you said, her kind of cinematic universe, right? And um, and I think the idea, and again, the the urge to find her mother is definitely still in there. Yes. Um, and you can tell because she asks questions, or we think that she asks questions about mothers. Um, you only ever get one clear question that she asks in all the descriptions of the footage, and that was when she asked Jeremy if he still misses his mother all the time. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy says, well, it's been sick. You know, it's been a while, essentially. So sometimes that's not there. And that's when she hits him. She strikes him physically. Yeah, because she's pissed because she still misses her mom, even though it's been a long period of time. And I think she's mad at him because he's found some way to move on sometimes and she hasn't, clearly. I don't think this is even like a chronic. It, it was in the moment rage that she had when she heard that answer. I'm not yeah, sure I agree. if she's doing that to all the other people. There's other footage where she's chasing after someone who got away. And then there's the weird like painting splotches on a hood thing, which I think has something to do with the cult because they had weird hoods on their heads, yes, too. Correct. Yeah. There. So you do make that connection connection when you find out that like there was a point where um, Lisa's dad uh, you know, after they were like moving around and following the call and after he had like hooked up with other um, people who had been affected by the cult, they actually found the cult one day and they staged a raid, but they only got some of them. And when they staged the raid, they threw hoods over their heads, I think with can't remember if they had like holes for their eyes or something. But the, I mean, that's clearly where the hoods come from. So, yeah, it's clear that like Lisa is just is just kind of painting out her trauma in all of this weird video shit she's doing uh trauma about her mother um and yeah i think the thing that's unsettling about the footage is that there are moments when you can't tell if she's hurting people i mean because when she's chasing someone that looks like they are scared and trying to get away that's a little concerning right yeah. um you know you see people lying on the ground being kicked or tied up and um, but in all the dialogue where Sarah Jane, like, oh, sorry, I was, I was telling this, trying to tell the story in chronological order and I got fucking sidetracked. Um, anyway, Lisa starts doing this video shit. Um, I, I don't know that it's clear that she's only manip manipulating videos from Video Hut or if it's other places as well. It must be other places as well. Cause there are sure. other video stores. Yeah. So, um. But I don't, I guess we don't really know, like, when she decides to do this to certain places or whatever. Yeah. There's no rhyme or reason there. Um, I don't even think there's a reasoning behind which movies she splices. No, it doesn't seem like it, unless it's something very, very cryptic that we didn't pick up on, but yeah. I don't think there is. Um, in any case, so she's doing this, and eventually, you know, like we were saying, by the time she gets to the Video Hut releases... Uh, someone mentions it to Jeremy, as Chris explained, like Jeremy watches them. He ropes in this girl, Stephanie, who's a Stephanie customer. Stephanie more ropes him in, I would say. Yeah, Stephanie's a customer who also saw some of the weird footage and like she kind of convinces him to be more curious about it. He thinks she's cute or something. So they, you know, that's his motivation there. Yeah. He's into her a little bit. Um, so they start doing their own investigation. And then Jeremy's like, he asks Sarah Jane to take a look. She kind of, she doesn't cause she's like, whatever, you know, and eventually she does though. Um, I forget what the impetus is for her checking out the films, but she does. And that's when she, you know, she recognizes the farmhouse because she grew up in the small town outside of Nevada, um, where Lisa lives. Uh, and she recognized there's something very identifiable about the, position of the barn and the other things on the property that jog Sarah's memory. 
she goes out there and I don't know, immediately be friends, falls in love with Lisa. Not really sure. That whole relationship is just a big old fucking question mark there. If you want um, my take on it, it's just that Lisa told her what was happening matter of factly. And she, upon learning what is going on, decides to help Lisa. She does decide to help Lisa. Um, because when the fear of the unknown, it was got, she got over it by understanding another human being or trying to understand this other human being. Yeah. But there, I mean, we don't know a lot about Sarah Jane. So to me, that whole attachment that they formed, I mean, Sarah Jane basically moves in and starts yeah. living there yes, and, and spending all of her time with Lisa. And, and that's just really weird to me. I mean, yeah. un unless they were, unless they were into each other in like a romantic sense, I, I don't see how that makes sense otherwise. Or, uh, I mean, unless she thought Lisa was in danger, but that's never, that's never, that's just something I pulled out of my ass. Like that's never mentioned or even It could just be at. pure fascination with what she's doing. Yeah. Um, I don't think we ever get any notes about Sarah Jane's mother situation, do we? No. Okay. Yeah. So, um. Sarah Jane ends up like living with Lisa and helping her with this video splicing and like stuff around the house. She keeps it a secret from everyone though. Um, Jeremy and Stephanie continue on and off their investigation, not really getting anywhere. And then Jeremy finds, how does he find out that Sarah, Sarah Jane, Jane is straight there? up tells him that she, she went to yep. that place and yep. where it is. That's right. And then he's like, what the fuck? Um, and one day he goes out there and then that's when he sees Ezra's car like flipped over there, his coworker and his car is full of videos and he's not sure like what that was about. You know, he, he's thinking he must've been brought there by the, you know, the fucked up. Yeah. Footage. Ezra found out about it too, assumedly. Yep. That's also super unclear, and that's almost like a pet theory that we have more than yeah. anything that's discussed or confirmed. Oh, yeah. By the way, uh, Jeremy's dad, Steve Helt, uh, he doesn't matter at all. He's just there. He only matters at the very end to serve as, like, someone connecting the the family that, that eventually ends the book with, with Jeremy. So he doesn't really have... That's why I'm not talking about him, I guess. That's just my point. Um, so Jeremy finds Ezra's car flipped over, um you know, gets him medical attention, goes into the house, talks to Sarah and Lisa. That's weird. Um, what happens chronologically after that? That's when Jeremy is either forced with Stephanie to oh, right. undergo right. some kind of interview. Yeah, Jeremy and Stephanie are then coerced, forced, not really sure to take part in the interview. That's where we talk about, you know, Jeremy's sitting in a chair and he gets hit in the face really hard by Lisa a few times. Um, this footage is then incorporated into their splicing, you know? No, that's not incorporated into the splicing, yeah, actually. Um, uh, no, I thought not. it was. No, it, so the, the only people that see that part are, is the family in the later portion of the book. They discover the unedited master tapes of the interviews. Oh, you're right. You're right about that. Because the stuff that's spliced into the videos is purposely vague and never has any sort of identifying information. They only knew his name was Jeremy because they had the master tapes of the interviews. Okay. Okay. You're right. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I guess I guess you're right about that. I honestly am not real, totally sure. But in any case, it becomes part of the archive if it's not actually put into any further films. But um, at that point, we don't really know what becomes of that whole gang. We just know that Lisa eventually leaves. And so does Sarah Jane, Jeremy gets a reg, uh, like more, I don't know, like a better job. Um, and then the, do we know the last names of that family that buys the Lisa sample property? Yeah, but I'd for, I didn't bother yeah. with that. So 10 years after that is what it says. So 10 years later, um, you know, so I guess in sort of present time, maybe a few years ago, you could say, Ed and Emily, this retired couple, buy the property. James and Abby, their child, their college age children, come to visit them. They're checking stuff out because um, they've only lived there a year. And the kids, of course, as kids do, even even in college age years, 
go into the basement and start rifling around. That's where they find the master tapes. No, 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 no. They find the master tapes in a burnt out car on the, like the side of the road on the property. Oh, in, in Ezra's old car. I believe that's the implication. So they put them in there afterward in the hopes that nobody would find them. Something like that? Because they definitely weren't in Ezra's car when it flipped over because those were all regular movies and they were still yeah, so splicing I'm things. I'm assuming okay. it might not be Ezra's car. It's some car that is burnt out and basically bereft of any functionality left on the property. And the master tapes of all the interviews that Lisa conducted, as well as all the old surveillance footage she had, was in like the trunk of that car, along with that stray dildo. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Which, now Sorry, that I'm you're... thinking about it, has a weird implication. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to gloss over that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. Uh, they watch They watch the master tapes they find in the chassis of the brand new car. They're all freaked out about it. You know, they're like, fuck, this is really weird. They watch hours and hours of it. Then they start piecing things together because of the names, I think, written or spoken Spoken. The names that are spoken on the tapes, they eventually... I should not remember how they make a connection to anyone. They just straight up start Googling names. Okay, yeah. It's James the son that's just like, I'm just going to look these people up. Yeah. I forget how he somehow pieces that together, but he gets in touch with uh, Jeremy's dad and gets Jeremy's email from his dad and then emails Jeremy... That's when Jeremy's like, well, this is Lisa's address, but you should leave her alone. But I also understand why you can't leave her alone because this is super fucking weird. They go to confront her, but then they see her in the window, wave at her, and they just kind of collectively decide to not confront her. Yeah. And that's that's the chronological order of events. (laughs) Yeah. So there was two retellings of the story right there just because it's such a weird story that's interwoven in a lot of weird ways and... There's a lot of these knots and connections throughout it that we have to untangle or think about, which to me is the mark of a pretty good story. Yeah. like Okay. So um, I guess we can, sorry about that really long intro, y'all. I guess we can get into the content. So I love, you know, if you're a longtime listener to CBC, you'll know this. I love things that I have to unravel. I love mysteries that give you enough clues um, to figure out things, but don't reveal totally everything. This is just my jam in general. It was also a really reasonable length. It was tightly written. Um, you also, you start off with the mystery right away. I mean, it's, it's in the summary, but it's also on like page two of the book. This book doesn't fuck around. It hooks you right away with like, Hey, there's fucked up shit on these tapes at the video store. And you're like, Oh fuck. I really want to know about the fucked up tapes. Is it child porn? Is it snuff? Is it something illegal? What is it? I mean, because that's like where your mind goes, right? So I initial, I immediately was like, "Oh, this is gonna be, this is gonna be dark in a certain way, in like a sex crimes murder sketch way." But I really loved that it was sketch in like a really fucking weird way that I couldn't have predicted. Yeah. Um, I love the things that it says about the dangers of uh, getting too into a certain group, aka cults uh, and religious cults specifically. Um. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the whole the story was really interesting and cool. Yeah, was really into it. Love the way it was executed. Like I said, if you've ever read Chuck Palahniuk books like Fight Club or uh, what, what else? Di- I didn't really like Diary. What's another one of his that I actually liked? Chris, you've read you've read his books, right? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fuck me then. I have not. Sorry, I thought you had. Um, nope, I've never read a Palahniuk book. Oh. Uh, well, I'm trying to remember. Uh, There's good old Fight Club. Yeah, like I love Fight Club, but there are there are other ones that I read that I liked, and now I can't remember what they were. <laughs> um. Anyway, he has several other books, including uh, Survivor, Lullaby, Diary, Haunted, etc. There, he's got a bunch. Uh, but his style, this reminded me a little bit of him, a little bit of like the Tarantino way of telling stories, where you kind of start at some points randomly and then go back to the earlier middle and then the beginning and then maybe the later middle and then the end. Uh, yeah. And to me, it's just a very interesting, compelling way to tell a story. The, um, I loved the writing in this book. I thought the descriptive writing was really great. Uh, I have some, I can pull some examples. Yeah. While you're pulling that, I can say that I can see why this author 
is considered an indie darling and one of the best lyricists in music. I mean, I that's a personal opinion subjectivity thing, but a lot of people bring up the Mountain Goats when they talk about really well-written lyrics. And uh, I've only listened to a handful of Mountain Goats tunes, but there's always one or two lines in there that are really great. And uh, I think that is reflected in some of the turns of phrase or descriptors you see in this book. Um, he does, Darnielle does a really good job of painting the scenery of these claustrophobically small towns and the nagging pull of wanting to understand something when you have no context for it whatsoever. Um, when you don't have a clear picture of someone or something at all, because really, I think that's one of the main points of this story is the the videos splicing are sort of this stand in for Lisa's trauma. It's sort of her pulling you in. Her trauma is spiraling out into the world physically manifested as these films and the people that see it want to know what's going on. What could have produced such weird imagery, such disturbing things and then when they go and talk to her and find out about her, um, they are sympathetic. No one ever calls the cops on Lisa. No one ever tries to get revenge or even after they're like subjected to her interviews, it, generally it seems like they kind of get it after and they would rather no one bother her. Well, from what we know, though, sure. there could have definitely been people that she killed um, that we will just never know about. There's a passage where she is really dodgy about that with Sarah Jane. And um, I think that footage of the woman running away and being pursued, you know, you could, you could draw a conclusion about that, I guess is what I'm saying. Sure. <sighs> um, anyway, I can, I can cite some good writing that I found. Please. Uh, so after Jeremy drags Ezra to the farmhouse and is really shaken up by the experience, uh, Sarah Jane off, you know, he asks for a glass of water and Sarah Jane gives him one and he says, thanks. The coldness of the glass in his hand drew him earthward down into the present moment, then eased him further down. He might easily have nodded off to sleep glass still in hand, like an old man in a rest home. Um, hang on. I got a few more. Yeah. Just some really puts you almost like that sentence itself describing you, him being brought earthward. It, it, some of the phrasing in here does that. It really pulls you into that moment. Oh, I like some of them were just funny. Like, uh, I forget. What was this even about? Um, it's talking about Sarah Jane, but it and the passage ends with, besides, who are you? Snakes have been here for millions of years. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, snakes. Um, it, it was to talk about snakes in the grass kind of thing, something to avoid the danger, sort of highlighting the dread people feel when they see this footage. Yeah. Um, I do wonder, though, I don't know. There are some questions we do have. Sorry, I'm supposed to be pulling um, good writing. Uh, here we go. This is about... Um, Jeremy's dad, Steve, uh, and how he's, tr it's talking about how he's dealing with the grief um, when his wife dies tragically in a car accident. It was important to Steve that the people he chose to share his private troubles with weren't the type to try to convince him to cry out loud and that they lived at least one county away. <laughs> he was trying to find a therapist. Um, over the years, he'd known lots of men who didn't want to make spectacles of themselves, whose need to retain their composure often surpassed their desire to be healed. Oh, that's a, Fucking That's a sharp one God there. damn, yeah. That was like a... Ugh. Uh, yeah, Chris's note was that hits a little hard, and my note was, but it true, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just some really emotionally insightful uh, writing and descriptions that were not cliche. You know, all the things that I love in a book. Um, it's just it's just got all the things. Uh, we still don't know what pepperoni chicken is, though, Chris. Do you oh, know yeah, what you know pepperoni chicken, is from, chicken is? What the fuck is pepperoni chicken? Paris? Yeah, they're talking about going to uh, Steve. Steve uh, Jeremy's dad, Steve, goes on a date with this woman named Shauna, and they go to an Applebee's, and she orders the pepperoni chicken. And Chris and I both wrote like a "What the fuck is that?" No, <laughs> excuse goes, me. What? This is like some barbecue pit boys thing where they're just jamming meats into <laughs> other meats or something. You don't know what the barbecue pit boys are. Be, just go on YouTube and look them up and be prepared for some meal abominations, like the one where they stuff hot dogs into a chicken breast. Oh, uh, why? 
Uh, let's see. Some other. Oh, this is a good one, too. Um, Ezra didn't usually get this much contact with the outside world. It made Jeremy feel obligated to protect him. On duty at the video store, they hardly ever exchanged more than a few sentences, but the, gr- the governing silence between them was the regional grammar of comfort between like-minded men. Oh, such a good way to describe that. I get that. that shit, too. Like, and th- I think one of the things that is highlighted in Jeremy's part of the story especially is this emotional distance that is part of, like I said, the governing fabric of the culture or in that area, especially between him and his dad. They very rarely talk about um, his mom and the. Or well, they bring it up a, a good amount, but they don't really dig into it that deep, right? They're sort of just mm. mention that yes, we're upset by this. Still, are you still dealing with this? Yes, I am. But they don't really dig too deep into it, as if to let the other person, you know, not feel attacked or too vulnerable about it. Which ends up, I think, somewhat distancing Jeremy from his dad, and they both want to feel a little bit closer, but they don't exactly know how to express it. In the same way that Lisa has all this trauma that she feels from loss and abandonment of, again, a a wife and mother that she does not quite know how to express and instead decides to embark on her quest, her video quest. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I think this this book is arguably a little bit about moms, uh, a little bit. A little bit about if you moms. look in the afterword, the, the uh, John Daniel basically said this book is largely about mothers. <laughs> <laughs> that's the well, direct quote from the author Paris. So ding, ding, ding! I was yep. right, yay! Yep. <laughs> um, which is interesting because this book reminds me in some ways uh, of House of Leaves, which you've probably heard me talk about ad nauseum on this show, which is also arguably about a mother. Um, yeah. So. Um, and that book, oh, that book fucked me up. It's That's a little of- bit more of a direct horror story for sure, but it has that same sense of dread that you get of seeing something you don't quite understand. Yeah, and the mystery and, and you know, the constant flipping back and forth between different different people and scenarios and points in time, you know. Um, it did, so it did remind me in a good way of that book, and I love that book. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've got, I've got some other good pull quotes, but we, we can talk about substance more. Um Chris, Chris, so Chris, um, much to my shame, did most of the created most of the notes uh, for this book. Um, I just ran out of time. So, Chris, if you have anything else you wanted to discuss specifically, we can. Sure. Um, I think one of the things that I enjoy about this book so much is that it spends a lot of time ruminating on the need to understand others and their choices and motivations. Um, from Jeremy and his father wanting to understand each other more, to Lisa and her whole video interview and rental splicing scheme, down to characters asking each other why they feel compelled to investigate. There's a lot of conversations in this book where it's just Jeremy asking Stephanie, but why do you have to know about this? And then even Jeremy turning to, you know, people asking Jeremy, why do you have to get more involved in this later on? So that curiosity, I think, is a, is a driving fact uh, force in the book for a lot of things, especially the dread that fills the book, which, you know, is a little bit of that horror angle that I guess Will was looking for. Um, but as well, it's, it's a driving f- factor of the need for human connection that most of us have in some shape or form. Yeah, um, I just think that there's a lot of things that you could that you could kind of get into in this book i think you're right um just trying to think if i have another point about about that specifically but um hey you know it's kind of a good thing when a book (laughs) makes you think a bit right paris like we we don't always have to be super on our toes here and the fact that it is giving us a lot of spots to sort of pause and consider what's going on yeah i'm also some good writing i guess something we can talk about is the, the question of the narrator I think it's very clear that it's Lisa at some point in the book, but early on, it really seems like it's Jeremy. And I, I just, and, but then I, I start, I start to wonder how would Lisa know be- these certain things unless it's from, from the interviews, unless she True. did very, very detailed interviews with Jeremy. Yeah. But even then, like how the fuck could she have remembered all? Well, I guess she could just replay the tapes, but I guess that may, yeah, I think I just answered my own question and now I feel fucking dumb. Yeah, I guess, I guess she could have just asked, asked them very, <laughs> no, that, very specific yeah, questions. That's fine. 
but then but then there's other things that I don't know how Jeremy would know, like all the details about his dad. His dad never told him that shit about his diary and, and therapy. And it's clear in the book, it says he never told yeah. anyone about it. So like, unless she also interviewed Steve, very possible. Could be. I mean, a lot of the book is in this third person omnipresent sort of perspective, <gasps> but then you'll Chris, have drops of I or she did me kind of happening. Because what? remember when Steve was like, that's mom, that woman running away, the woman who's like being pursued who I was speculating may have been killed or, or perhaps held against her will. Steve, when he sees it with Jeremy and, and Shauna, he's convinced that it's Jeremy's mom. And I wonder, I wonder if that's a clue or I wonder if it's just. Like he got drawn in or Jeremy told him about what had happened and he goes to investigate as well because. Yeah. I wonder if he curious. later thinks about that and then ends up getting interviewed too. Um, or if he was interviewed way before be. and just doesn't connect that they're related, also very possible. Um, yeah, I would think after because he's also very like perturbed by the original set of footage that he sees, and I feel like he you would probably recognize the corrugated metal shed that you were tied to a chair and yeah, interrogated fair. in. Um, anyway, maybe, but that was the thing that kind of troubled me. I was like, I don't understand how she knows all of these inner details all the time. Uh, there's, cause at the beginning, sorry. I was just going to say that there's also these parts, a couple of segments in the book where the narrator slash Lisa goes off on a tangent. That's like the, in another version of the story, this might've happened, but that's not what really happened. And those are the only segments that left me mystified as to why they were included. Because if that's not this version of the story, what's the point of Maybe it's like Lisa's fantasies of what she wanted to happen, because one of those is, you know, in another version of the story, my, you know, Irene might have came back to my house and drove up and finally reintroduced herself, but that never happened. And one point, this is where that point where I mentioned Irene being left behind after being arrested for shoplifting comes up. It's in one of those paragraphs, and I was very confused as to whether that was a confirmed fact of what happened, because when they stage that raid on the cult. Irene isn't there. And I think that's sort of where Lisa doesn't fully give up, but gives up the, you know, town to town search a lot of the time you could say, because if she wasn't with the cult there, she's basically lost. Yeah. It says, um, sorry. Completely. Um, I found that, that passage. It says, um, okay, this is Sarah Jane and Jeremy talking. I met a friend who needs a little help. She said, this is Sarah Jane, her eyes never leaving the road. And then Jeremy says, all right, but Ezra, uh, he's just a kid. Her expression did not change. My friend needs all the help she can get. She said lightly, as if it were something already asked and answered. It takes a crew to raise a building. Everyone needs a little help sometimes. It would be great. It would be great to tell you that you're going to see Irene sample again that we have shifted our focus in order to make her return all the more joyous and conflicted, that she's going to call Collins from someplace far away, maybe today, and say she's all right, and that her life has been a journey through good and bad, good times and bad, that she'll say, I can't explain it, I can hardly believe it myself, while her daughter, grown up. So it goes on about, like, it wants to say that. <laughs> um, where is she? It would be my sad duty then to tell you about how the line goes dead as Lisa is unburdening herself, the dial tone breaking in to alert her that for some indeterminate stretch of time, she has been talking to herself or to no one or to the birds in the field. She sees through the window from her place by the wall phone in the kitchen. I wouldn't like that following Lisa out onto the front porch. See, like it's points, those points of narration where I'm like, is the narrator always Lisa? Is it some like eighth party that we just never meet? Who discovers all this John stuff? John Darnielle saying, like, I had this alternate version of the story, but here's why I didn't publish it. <laughs> like, um, you know, I wouldn't like that. Following Lisa out onto the front porch where the gourd bird feeder colonized by wasps is now gone, replaced by a hummingbird feeder, which is tidier, sure, but birds nest in the gourds. They lay eggs that hatch. It's wondrous. And what does she say to Jeremy and Sarah Jane when they return from surveying the scene of the accident? How can she explain? I'd settle for saying that Irene just shows up one day a few weeks from now out of the clear blue sky, the way people sometimes seem to do in Lisa's life. So again, this is why I think this, the narrator isn't always Lisa. Uh, yeah, you're right. 
there she is. I mean, unless Lisa's speaking in the third person. I mean, I guess that's possible, but that's kind of a shitty thing to do as an author. Uh, the, you know, the way people seems to seem to do in Lisa's life. There she is now, an old woman pulling up in an Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra. Blah, 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 blah. Um, it'd even be okay if, if we had to learn that something has gone terribly wrong, that she gets arrested for shoplifting in Rapid City one year and takes a plea, and when the group moves on, they leave her behind. And so after... So this seems like something that didn't happen to me. Okay. Um, but... Again, yeah, it's, like, but why include these? Like, what's the point of this ruminating here? So, so my, I think that the narrator changes. I don't think it's one consistent narrator. I think that sometimes it's Lisa, sometimes it's an unnamed person that we never meet. So this person talking now, I think it's like an omniscient narrator, like just a just you know, uh, eye in the sky. Or some, like I said, some like fucking eighth party removed or something who is maybe investigating all of this years later and we just never meet them. They're never part of the story. Because it's not always Lisa. Again, unless Lisa is talking about herself in the third person, but that's kind of a dick move on the author's part and it doesn't seem like that's something that he would do here because every choice he makes seems to be very intentional in the text. So, Yeah, but you know, Eh. authors aren't perfect human, you know, with logic machines. So it could have just been a, this, this is like, Again, this is the weirdest choice by Danielle. I don't I don't understand. Yeah, I, I don't understand. Because I, I don't know that it aids anything to the story. Yeah, I'm so curious or... now. I'm going to get drawn to his house oh. and just question him. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Mountain Goat. Uh, <laughs> we're here. Mr. Goats, um, I would like you to please explain yourself as to why your narrator isn't distinct all the time. How did you find me? Well, you see... <laughs> I recognized on page 27 that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So, so yeah, um, I think that, I think that the musings about maybe things that couldn't, that didn't actually happen are, I I don't know, maybe just a reflection of how people are. (laughs) Uh, We all do that um, ourselves, but. um... That that was really my only bad thing to bring up about this book. (laughs) Uh, you have, sorry, you have the next note here, so I'm just going to let you go on that rant. Well, one of the things that I, that I really liked about this book um, is that I've always been fascinated by this idea of pieces or fragments of who we are being left behind and waiting for someone to stumble upon. There's this paragraph uh, towards the end of the book about one of the videos that Lisa edited, one of like the rental tapes, ending up on the back shelf of some Goodwill stockroom and it's never seen again by pretty much anyone. It's just kind of left there forever, I'm assuming. And that's it's a fascinating idea to me. Um, it's this sort of personal dust that we leave behind us. And in Lisa's case, it's very concrete because she's putting her stamp of her existence onto some rental tape that, you know, otherwise would just be some movie out there. Um, but... It's the kind of thing that becomes more and less meaningful as time goes on because the more time that passes before someone sees it, the less context they're going to have about the time that it occurred in. um, And it becomes a rarer and rarer window into that particular person's time and life and choices. Um, And I have this sort of sci-fi novella idea slash fantasy I have about um, my music or someone's music being found millennia later, like it's on some server somewhere. Um, the former society we all lived in is dead and gone. People have to go in and like find these old sets of data in hard drives and decode them to <laughs> pull out, you know, old songs, old stories, fan fiction sites, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but I, I, I have this fantasy about someone just like finding like all the band camp pages and just like getting to listen to these millennia old tunes and trying to figure out why these were written in the context they were written in oh my favorite my favorite thing to fantasize about is like hilarious assumptions made because future civilizations only find like one random thing and it makes me think about how wrong we must be about past situations like like if somebody finds you know uh, late bloomer and they're like man humans humans had cloacas at that point in time? I know like, wow that's what we have to yeah, broadcast like... out into space and aliens find it yeah and they like... have just because <laughs> you don't fucking know like, wow humans yeah. are weird 
Uh, and same for us, like all the things that we uncover, we, we can make a lot of educated guesses about things. And of course, as we find more and more evidence, the picture becomes clearer, but there are many civilizations for which we do not have a lot of clues or evidence. And so it is funny to me to imagine how fucking wrong we are about things. It's funny and fascinating to me. It's, it, it fills in this space of existential dread that I, that we all have, but like in my particular hole, I suppose <laughs> that, um, inside your butt pussy. Yeah, well, not there. Sorry, um, sorry. Oh, you know what? There's no content warning about butt pussies. I should probably strike that from the record. Continue. <laughs> that's okay. We could, That's not under the barnyard language clause. Fair, I believe, fair. Butt was. pussy has now been integrated into the barnyard language lexicon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but yeah, th that's this fascinating idea I've always had, and I've always kind of wanted to write this like sci-fi short story based around the idea of someone from a far-flung future finding someone's album or ep that they made that fucking no one listened to but that's what survived out into the distance the far far reaches of time and it gave someone centuries or millennia later this weird little tiny window into your particular psyche I that's all cool. I just read the next note and I'm so mad because we both have or maybe I'm happy because we both have the same pet theory. Okay, well, I'll let you kind of attend to this one. <laughs> uh, so the pet theory that Chris wrote down that we both shared without talking to each other. Um, the theory is that Jeremy's mom got wrapped up in the Lisa Sample cinematic universe, got drawn to Lisa, just like Sarah Jane and Jeremy and Stephanie and Ezra did, and was forced to do an interview from which she tries to escape and run away from, which is why Steve sees her in the footage. And then she gets in her car, tries to speed home and dies. I think that totally checks out. And I also had that suspicion. Um, I, I mean, I know Chris, your note says the evidence is loose and I think this didn't happen at all. I, I don't know. I think that that's, that's a very, com I think it's very possible that that happened. Um, it's a, it certainly would be an interesting way to touch upon the idea of trauma spiraling out and touching other people. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, again, it's not, it's nothing concrete, but I think it is a, I think it's a theory you could argue for. Sure. Um, and it's one that I Especially thought of since as we well. Both had that, since we both had that idea, it gives a little bit of credibility. The only thing that counts against it is I think you know, Jeremy would recognize his own mom a little bit too. And you could say that Steve is perhaps, you know, more desperately searching for a sign of his, you know, ex-wife or something. He's in deeper grief and that's why he wants to see something. But it could go either way. And that's sort of the name of the game in this whole book, I would say. Well, I also think that it's, um, I don't know. I think that it's possible because I don't think they ever list a reason for why she got into a car accident. No. And um, it was on the same stretch of road that the... Uh, the house is on farmhouse. So yeah. And, and I mean, after what we've seen, I mean, I think the, I think that Ezra's accident is just a callback for that. You know, yeah, Ezra could also have been involved somewhat too. You, you know, yeah. He had a bunch of, yeah, weird, he was not unedited tapes in his, in his car. I don't know. Perhaps I don't know. We a load of tapes to Lisa. Yeah. We, we don't know that whether they were edited or not though. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's very possible that, um, yeah, I think it's very possible that what we described is true, that Lisa Sample could potentially be the reason that Jeremy's mom died. Although, maybe that timeline doesn't check out, though, because she died six years earlier, and I don't know if Lisa was there six years before. Yeah. Mm, I don't know if it's clear. Uh, hang on. I'm actually at the... I actually wanted to read the end from Lisa's perspective. It's only... Uh, like a page and a half, two pages. So just so you can hear how Lisa herself wraps up the story. Um, after dad died years later, back in Crescent, I saved the surveillance tapes he'd gotten from the private investigator. They weren't hiding in a high cupboard or in a lockbox. He'd kept them in the entertainment center in the living room, like something you might watch on any idle evening. His clothes I drove across the river to the Goodwill on North 78th. They might have gone to a vintage store in the old market by then and fetched a decent price. They were so well-preserved, relics of a simpler time. Surely they were worth something, but I felt a need to empty the house quickly and methodically. 
It wasn't the house I'd lived in as a child. But Crescent is small. The house my mother left behind forever one Christmas was only a few blocks away. I stood in my father's room sorting his things into piles and tried to remember what our family had been like. But clear memories wouldn't come. Everything blurred. I couldn't even make out their faces. It was like someone had scribbled over them in black marker or wrapped them in shrouds. The rest of his effects went to people from the church, old ladies who had known my father when he was young. I thanked them for making it easier, and they helped me find boys from the high school to help with the furniture. I stood by while they worked, watching the house grow empty, the last remaining traces of my family vanishing into the gleam of things swept clean. It felt strange to be helping this work along, but the drive within me was instinctual, as natural to me as the brownness of my hair and eyes. When we had finished, I headed back through Iowa alone. At my apartment in Nevada then, later, at the Collins farmhouse, I bought by pooling dad's life insurance money with the proceeds from the Crescent house, I watched the surveillance tapes, surveillance tapes night after night. Sorry, I can't read today. They were hypnotic. They calmed me somehow, kept me centered. The anonymity of the people at the bus stops and around the bonfires or the trash dumps or behind the bowling alleys, alleys, there was a sort of hope in it, a gathering of possibilities that could never be dispelled entirely because the names of the faces in the frame were lost forever. They could have been anybody. There was no way to say who they were or were not. They were free. In their untrackable freedom, I located a place to store something I had carried with me since Christmas of 1972, something whose need for space grew greater every year. I found a second VCR at a yard sale and began collecting moments from the endless time-stamped hours of my father's fruitless search. If you learn to look hard enough, you can find stories in seemingly impenetrable tableaus, street scenes, parking lots, people waiting for a bus. I made a few friends, people who were drawn to me, to my steady strength, to my knack for making any place I stood feel like a permanent shelter. I preserved their stories, and when they had no stories, I gave them stories they could call their own, stories I trust they have carried with them in their travels beyond my reach, and I made of these stories a permanent record on tape. I filled in the parts I couldn't know or needed to change with bits and pieces of other people's stories, from the movies, I mean, but they all seemed to lead me to the same place. No attempt to change the outcome found purchase, however adept I became at splicing and cutting and smoothing transitions. I left all this to ferment in the place where the people on Dad's tapes had gone, the great nowhere, the land whose air assumes the familiarity of whatever surroundings it finds. But it was never far from me, I learned. It was contained, but still curious. Left to guess at the dark around it, it became subject to simple metabolic laws of action and reaction. When it all burst free from its tank at the house in Collins, I sold the place quickly through a broker, said a hard goodbye to yet another friend I'd never see again, and finally came home. So that's the explanation we get from Lisa at the end. Uh, I don't know. I Hopefully that was helpful, but... It, it's very illuminating of the style of mystery resolution we get here, which is generally to get a little piece of understanding, a little window into someone's life, and then it's gone. Yeah, like I said, I think there are, there are a lot of messages here. Uh, we've talked about most of them. We do, I think we both recommend you read this book. Should you read it? Yes, read this book. Um, unless, unless you don't like uncomfortable, unresolved, like puzzle books. I mean, if you, if you're not into that, then I can see why maybe you didn't like it, but, um, read it uh, again. Uh, Will is right. It's not a horror book. Whoever classified it as that is kind of weird. It's definitely a thriller suspense. I mean, there are, there is suggestion of captivity and suggestion of maybe torture question mark, or maybe even death, but we don't, it's not explicit. And, and again, I, I think the book kind of leads you to another place, but um, yeah. So read this book. Um, I mean, we don't need to fix this. So for the, can we no. fix it section? Uh, no, Nope. Doesn't need fixing real good. <laughs> I had a little like one liner almost review <laughs> that I wrote in the, can we fix it section? Cause I, when I kind of write as if I'm answering the question, can we fix it? And I just don't think it needs fixing. It's a well-paced story that mixes a bit of suspense Midwestern monotony, and the sprawling web of human connections into a tight narrative that explores the transient connections we forge and break, whether through shared trauma, curiosity, or simply location. Hey. Put me on your book for a blurb there, Mr. Darnielle, please. Also, it's, uh, it's a little bit about moms. Uh, that's about it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, this was pretty great. Like I said already, it reminded me of the mystery I felt while reading House of Leaves. I think I might have wanted a teaspoon of more detail to explain Lisa's deal because it's it's still a little weird. But hey, overall, you know, I actually ended up getting more from Lisa in terms of explanation than I expected. 
So that's good. Uh, a good book, especially if you're looking for like 90s, early 2000s, uh, sort of like a setting in that time in America, like a modern thriller with kind of a Chuck Palahniuk, House of Leaves feel. Um, that's, that's, yeah, it's good. It's really good. I would definitely read this. I would recommend this book. I would say the only two minor, minor, minor notes I had were um, I kind of lost interest when we started going deep into Lisa's parents' lives, like I, yeah, Irene little... and Peter Sample. It just went on for a little too long, and I was like, this is not... And, and I still feel like it didn't give me anything, even at the end. So I think some of that could have been cut, but overall, this is pretty tightly written uh, with, without, without that one critique. Um, and secondly, this isn't a critique for the author. It's a critique for whoever published it, I guess, but this isn't a horror book. Yeah, re- no. recategorize this shit. It's not horror. No. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the author himself wanted it to be cast yeah, as that. Yeah, I don't know. It's true. Um, but, Will, if this is a terrible book that you've read, can you please recommend us books that you liked? Because <laughs> those, those must be great, man. Um, um, yeah. Will's generally super cool. I've only c- talked to him like a handful of times, I have to admit. But um, generally a fervent supporter of the arts, our patron for a long time now. Um, pretty much like listens to every other local metal band that's out here and like goes to the shows when there were shows. Um, so yeah, just thanks, Will. Cool dude. Please give me actual book recommendations of stuff that you liked. Cause I would definitely like to see what makes the top of your list. If this comes towards the bottom. Yeah, this was a, this was a great read. It was really nice and refreshing to read something we really loved. So, um, yeah, cool. And, uh, Mr. Darnielle. Fuck it. A plus, man. It was a great book. Thanks. Yeah, I like I did a little bit more digging into, you know, Mr. Daniel here just to kind of get a better picture. Like I said, I explored some uh, of his songs, but I looked up some of his other books. And you might be pleased to know that his first book is called Master of Reality. Yes, named after that first Black Sabbath album, because it's basically uh, him analyzing the the album and sort of its impact on metal culture oh. through the lens of like a institutionalized fifteen year old who gets his Walkman with a tape of Master of Reality taken away from him, and uh, just another fun detail. Um, since you didn't read that article I sent you, Paris, um, uh, Mr. Danielle is an avid fan of extreme metal and has oh. a lot of like well thought out opinions about it and like on. Un- has a lot of interesting things to say about the difference between indie culture and metal culture. I would say that is pretty on point. I would say. Yeah, that's, so, I mean, that's rad. I would, I will definitely read another of his books, especially if it's about heavy metal and especially if he's into heavy metal, because that means he can write about it well. So that's fun to know. Um, yeah, I would, I'll totally read that eventually, you know, when I have time for things again, whenever <laughs> yeah. that is. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I think that concludes our review of Universal Harvester. Check this shit out. Danielle rules. Yeah, this wasn't exactly a laugh a minute episode, but it was a great discussion because this was a great book. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it's how long have we been recording? Uh, I, About an hour 10. Okay. Yeah. We got a little bit more time. So, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about our latest author email. So we, yay, <laughs> author emails. They're a rarity. And usually when we one... get them, they're uncomfortable (laughs) (laughs) and negative but this one was positive and really fun so um we actually got an email from is that chris help me thank you we got an email from that person the person who wrote the who uh wrote the virus of desire uh the book we reviewed in episode 94 yeah so um if you haven't listened to that episode, oh God, it's, you got to go back and listen to that episode. It's a lot of now, fun. Now there's a laugh a minute. Yeah, it's a lot of fun laughing at episode. So we, Chris and I were like, oh, this had to be written by an AI and blah, blah, blah. So it was just so nice to hear from the author. And um, I'm just going to read some selections from their email, uh, just because I don't want to give away anything about who they are since uh, they did, as Chris uh, figured out, they did write under a pseudonym. So it's going to keep that the veil of secrecy (laughs) you know firmly firmly wrapped around our little terrible shoulders all right uh hi it's me i'm yet i'm insert chris pronouncing this name correctly so before anything else 
I must say, I feel privileged and honored to feature in your podcast. It was a blast, and I almost pissed myself while listening to it. And also, I 100% agree with your criticism. I am aware that Virus of Desire is by no means a good book, but that is how it was supposed to be. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in linguistics in Warsaw, and earlier this year, I listened to a Behind the Bastards podcast episode on pandemic grifters. And I thought to myself, heck, I want to be a grifter too. How hard can it be? So I came up with an idea to make it an erotic book, but I also didn't want to overwork myself. Hence the neural network. You guessed it right. It was talk to transformer GP2 model. Although I study cognitive science and have some theoretical knowledge how to build neural networks, GPT2 seemed like an easy, uh, the easiest, least stressful way. I've obviously done a lot of editing and conceptual work, but the content was mostly generated. And obviously, the grift did not succeed. I've earned almost nothing through it. <laughs> then again, <laughs> yeah, as well said, then again, it was a crossbreed of an art project and an exploration of the potential of generated literature. I spent much more on doing it than I profited from it. You also guessed the method of producing it. The procedure was simple. I type in a short input sentence. GPT-2 generates output. I insert the output as an input and regenerate the output if I'm not happy with the result. And it goes on repeatedly for as long as I have the energy to do that. For three weeks, I lived in a parallel world of generated content. It is quite surreal to read news that does not exist, addresses that don't exist, emails that do not exist. Very often, I Googled them to reassure myself that it is not existent. (laughs) The result was trashy, over-the-top, incomprehensible nonsense, and I liked it very much. It made me and my partner laugh, so I decided that it is ready to be released. But bear in mind, we spent dozens of hours correcting and curating it. Why I called myself, insert Chris pronouncing this name correctly, it is a moniker from a Facebook group that was used to communicate with uh, roommates in a certain city. Everyone had a name based on the thing that was most irritating to everyone that that person did. So we had names uh, like mine, which means not entirely closed sideboard or credenza. <laughs> so I li- Paris, I live with this person. I believe <laughs> Not entirely closed cabinet door. That is a bad habit that our our old roommate uh, or Chris's current roommate, uh, our our other best friend has. Uh, It's amazing. Uh, Not entirely closed cabinet. What would what would my Chris? What would my uh, irritating habit name be? Oh, it's been a while since I lived with you, man. So like, I can't I can't like give an accurate. Um, I'm trying to think of one for you. Oh, well, I have one thing, but I, I don't think I'm going to say that on here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think mine... Let's just say too loud. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's not go back to that. But yeah, too loud. Okay. All right. Uh, I think for you, it would be uh, weed smell. I fucking hate <laughs> the smell of weed. It's so gross to me. And uh, Chris is a big fan. So that's that's one thing we we uh disagreed on but some of these names are great uh i'll just read one because i don't want to out who this person is the one that made me laugh the most is someone's name was that fucking french press which i just love (laughs) oh such a brilliant idea for the name uh this per the author says that they also commemorated living it with that group of people by writing a collection of buddhist garbage poetry um and that is also available for free online the author notes that they believe strongly in open culture. Um, and they acknowledge that they, they kind of knew our patron who recommended it, but like, not really. It was sort of like, they're just, I don't know, distant acquaintances. acquaintances. Yeah. And, and he didn't ask him. He just like f- found out that it, it got on the show. So, so what a nice uplifting email. Uh, sure. I love hearing from listeners. I, I, I will say I don't love hearing from authors because it's usually bad, <laughs> but uh, this was a really lovely surprise. So thank you, Mr. Uh, Credent. I hope that you remember to shut the door next time. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'll try to be a little less loud and Chris will try to smell a little less like weed. Um, yeah, I'm, it's a lot less lately, I'll say. Yeah, I haven't been to your house since uh, February yep yeah yeah Yeah. sounds about right you know you know why for for the reasons for the plague reasons um but anyway it was really great thank you so much for the email we are really glad that you had a good time with the episode uh we had a great time as well and uh listeners if you haven't listened to episode 94 fucking get on it it's a roaring good time chris did some really excellent sound work for that one so get over there all right so 
Um, we this, we don't have any more patron recommendations for 2020. So um, the last fin- the final selections for the year will just be stuff that Chris and I picked from uh, the kind of the bin of recommendations, the general recommendations that people give us. Uh, non patron recommendations. Yeah, non patron. So it's either stuff that like Chris and I found, or somebody emailed us about a year ago, or maybe like a book my boyfriend found in his basement when he was cleaning, or you know, like things that people recommend to us on in YouTube comments. We kind of we we do some digging through things to try to find a nice nice mess of things. So um, we've planned out the rest of 2020. But if any of you patrons at the uh, five or ten dollar tiers have recommendations, please get them to us so we can squeeze them in. Otherwise, you're probably going to be shit out of luck until next year because Chris and I usually do a bunch of pre-records for November and December so that we can take a break. So um, get those recs in if you want them this year. Otherwise, 2021. Speaking of patrons, let us thank our roster of patrons. Firstly, let us thank Will for this lovely recommendation today. Thank you, Will, for supporting TBC and for supporting our respective bands. Uh, That's pretty cool. (laughs) <laughs> generally one of our biggest patrons for everything we do <laughs> thanks, thanks will you're red um you're cool as heck dude we'd also like to thank dari greg veronica d lynn Sinya, yakub bobby black cat jensina mayo cat elliot kieran martin jay and our newest patron scott thank you for joining the ranks of tbc patrons we welcome you to the fold um, and with Scott's addition, we've actually changed up the $5 tier, $5 a month tier. So now if you want to recommend us a book, you, you got to go to the $10 tier. But those of you that are already in the $5 tier, you are good forever. Um, unless you leave and then try to come back. Sorry. Uh, but, um, the $5 tier now is just for bonus content. Uh, if you want to make us read a book and you are not already a patron, you got to go for that $10 a month tier. So that's your public service announcement for that. If you want to support the show, again, you can join. You can get a Patreon subscription for us. You can subscribe or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Goodreads. You can also just tell people about the show and share it. Honestly, that's cool and costs you nothing, so that would be great. Uh, or you can also review us or rate the show on whatever uh, podcast platform you use, whether it's Podchaser, iTunes, or what have you. If you want to get in touch with us directly, you can send us a message through DMs on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or Goodreads, or you can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. I don't know that we have any other announcements, Chris, do we? No, um, generally not, except for, uh, when is this uh, episode going up, Paris? It's going up like... October 27th is the date that this episode... Go vote. Vote. Oh fuck. Vote. Fuck. Vote. 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 If you have questions about how to vote, legitimately fucking email us and we will get back to you. We are big proponents of voting. Um I've already voted. Chris has already voted. Uh Chris, you went in person early voting, right? No, I did um I got a mail in ballot and I put it in a drop off box. Um, make sure it's an official drop-off box. Also, make sure it's not, it's not, it's voted least likely to be set on fire by crazy people. Um, sure. Because that's also a thing that can happen. So, uh, yeah, do that, please. If you, you, you have the time, you can do it. It's super easy this year, actually, in most states, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even in Massachusetts. Like, I'm voting absentee from Minnesota, and I got my ballot uh, in a pretty timely fashion. I'm actually going to send it out tomorrow. Uh, my boyfriend and I are voting together tonight because we're just s- disgusting. Uh, I did that with my partner, too. <laughs> yeah. Paul, so. It's actually, I got to say, man. Voting at home is such a nice experience because I feel like whenever I go to vote, um, Massachusetts has never had at home like a mail in voting before. Um, unless without a reason, yeah. you can do absentee without some reason, but now they're like anyone can and, do it. And dude, it's so relaxing because, like, whenever I voted in person before, it's been I've been like sweating and nervous and like, oh god, I can't take up too much time. I gotta like, I gotta look up all the shit before I go there and try to remember like which ballot initiatives I'm voting for and which which like small time reps down the ballot. When you're at home, you can just look this stuff up on your fucking phone at your leisure. No sweating, you know, no, no worrying, <laughs> no, no time limit. You just, Unless you got the heat turned up way high. You yeah. Know? You know, you just, you just have this really comfortable experience where you can feel totally confident in your vote. And 
Um, I just, I find it lovely. And I really it's hope great. that we hold on to mail-in voting. This should not go away post-pandemic. Yeah. I hope people, now that they have a taste of it, they're like, wait, no, this should be the thing. Yeah, it's great. And early voting, too, is really nice because there's so few people. Well, in some states, I shouldn't say everywhere, but in some places, <laughs> early voting is a leisurely experience in a lot of places. It's not a guess, but anyway... If you have not yet voted, uh, it is October 27th. If you are a person in America who is legally allowed to vote, fucking get out your vote, goddammit, and get other people around you to vote too, please. Um, please, again, I am totally willing to field voting questions. <laughs> if, you, if you are confused, just let me know. Uh, let us know, and we will try to help you. That's how passionate TBC is about voting. So uh, with that, we will close the episode, I suppose. That's that's all there is to it. All right. We'll see you in two weeks. We'll actually see you on Election Day. Uh, the next yeah. episode after this is on Election Day. So uh, we'll see you then. All right. Bye, Paris. Goodbye, Chris. Goodbye, Chris.